Good afternoon. Uh, today we have the first seminar about the interconnection between the economies of Belarus and Russia. I would like to remind everyone that we also have a simultaneous interpretation available. So if you'd like to select the English channel, you're welcome to do this. Uh, this way you'll be listening to us in English. You're free to send uh, your comments and uh, commentaries, uh, questions into the chat. I can also raise your hand. We'll be happy to listen and to read out your questions and pro pro your possible remarks. Now I'll give floor to the moderator of today's seminar, the PhD in economy and head of the European Dialogue Group, Mr. Evgeny Gontmacher. Thank you, Anton. Uh, we have an uh, exciting moment today because we, uh, together with Alice Arikhnovich and a number of colleagues from Belarus, we have uh, uh, been discussing for a long time how to act in the current political situation in Belarus, how to cooperate in this situation because in a good sense of the world, but Russia and Belarus are uh, connected in a special way. Personally, I'm confident that in many ways we have a joint future. And as a person who is a member of the European Dialogue Group, I believe it's a pro-European future. We have arrived at a solution of opening a, a launch in a a series of meetings, not only on, about economy, but it's a, in, I hope it have to do also with uh, social issues, uh, management issues. We will form the agenda together. The second organizer is uh, Center of Social Economic Development, the case in, from Belarus where Alice Lichnovich is the vice president. On a regular basis, we uh, organize the exchange of opinions between the Belarusian and the Russian experts. By the way, we also uh, would like to welcome experts from other countries who are interested in this topic. Today, uh, we decided for to open our discussions, our cycles uh, with uh, general issues. We call it the interconnectedness, interconnection of Belarus and the Russian economies. Everybody knows that uh, closely connected, but how uh, in fact does it happen? What happens after Belarus overcomes this crisis and we hope it uh, will be uh, end up in Belarus becoming a free democratic country. What hap will happen to the economy of Belarus and the economy of Russia? We'll discuss all that range of issues. We'll only start discussing that today because the, I believe this is a topic uh, is uh, huge and I'm not an expert on Belarus, but I'm confident that Belarus, there are very few professionals uh, dealing with the uh, Russian Belarus relations. I'm not considering propagandists, but experts. And would really like uh, to have this meet at the expert level without uh, putting tags to uh, think objectively how to move forward in this joint future of the European kind. Today, we also have two reporters from the Belarusian side, where they have uh, short remarks. The first will come Alice Alikhnovich, apart from being a vice president of the uh, case, research case Belarus, is also representative of the uh, 
economic uh, block of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, also Lev Lvovsky, who is a PhD, a senior researcher at the Center for Economic Research, Birok, and Belarus, he will also speak today. Also, we uh, invited uh, as a consultant and uh, as people who uh, can express their opinion on the topics, several people. I will introduce them. Um, regular uh, in their own time. They're all uh, mentioned in the announcement ad, and I would like to talk about the agenda. I suggest that uh, Alice and Viknovich and Lebrovsky uh, express them points uh, in 10 minutes each, and then during the Q&A, I suggest we uh, call it laconic and not repeat ourselves. I hope uh, one hour, one hour 15, one hour 30 minutes should be enough for this discussion, not just focus during this meeting. Moreover, I would like to repeat that we'll hold them regularly in the future and the issues that we'll raise today will be discussed later to this or that degree. After this introductory remarks, I would like to give floor to Mr. Alekhnovich, please. The floor is yours. Good afternoon. Thank you, Evgeny. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy that I have the opportunity to organize this a series of the economic seminars, mostly on economic topics, but we can also exchange our opinions, ask questions, and discuss what is already happening in the economic relations between Belarus and Russia and what will probably happen in future. What would be the best way to conduct relations in the future? Since this is the first seminar of its kind, I believe it's important to start with a general evaluation, assessment of the situation, the status quo of the situations of, uh, and to say, discuss how the Belarusian economy depends on the Russian economy. I have 10 minutes, so uh, to be brief, it's not a secret to anyone that the Belarusian economy really depends a lot on the Soviet, on the Russian economy. This, despite the 30 years of our independence and sovereignty, this is a heritage from the Soviet past, still experiences from interconnected between Belarus and Russia. For many years, colleagues, please turn off the, your microphones when you're not speaking. For many years, the general energy, economic and financial support of Russia for so-called uh, uh, wind cases allowed for to conduct uh, development of Belarus without structural reforms. Unfortunately, Belarus was not very effective in using these possibilities. Instead, by wasting the uh, cheap Russian loans to support the non-reformed non state sector, which contributes now about 50% of the um, GDP, which is the biggest figure in Europe. After 30 years of independence, we still have a highly dependent economy based on one country. Uh, every year we conduct meat, milk, and oil and gas war wars because Belarus is used to uh, living based on the preferential loans and the uh, lower prices for oil and gas. Belarus has used to this. Every time Russia tries to lower the dose, the Belarus is uh, shaking. Let's look into the four major spheres. First, as a major energy subsidies, export of goods, uh, of foreign debt and uh, foreign direct investment. As to the energy subsidies, here, yeah. Uh, we mean the import of the cheap gas and 
a petroleum of the last 20 years belarus on the bridge bought 19 billion cubic meters of gas of the lowest price in europe uh, if we do not consider russia now belarus is the and has been for many years is the fourth major importer of russian gas natural gas it was only germany turkey and italy which bought more natural gas than belarus to de determine the uh, volume of the subsidies for belarus and economies we can compare belarus and the price for russian gas for belarus with the price of the on average of the russian gas for european consumers only then we'll see that belarus saved uh, uh, from 20, 2000 the year 2000 and uh, the, 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 till year 2020 40 billion dollars if we compare the price for belarus with the price of the russian gas at the eastern border with russia and uh, uh, deduct the transportation cost from germany to belarus then uh, we'll come up with a bigger figure about 50 billion us dollars that's as far as the natural gas is concerned but in 2020 the first time in its history belarus paid on average the price which is higher than the uh, average price for europe and that of the single price for germany minus the transportation cost in the short um, in the mid-term perspective, well, prices will probably grow up and those will be able to buy prices for the price, which is a bit lower. Moreover, the shipments of all petroleum over the last 20 years, Belarus bought 18 million tons of oil with tax or um, some sort of tax. Uh, we will also manage to re-export uh, products based on the Russian petroleum, not to buy uh, fee, not to pay f uh, fee into Belarusian economy. Over the last 20 years, the figures can move up about 60 billion US dollars. So natural gas plus petroleum products added to the Belarusian economy about $100 billion. In 2020, the difference between the price of the world price of oil and the uh, Belarusian price oil was only 15 percent compared to the gdp the level of the oil subsidies was the lowest in history thanks to the uh, tax maneuver in russia in, by 2024 belarus will be buying petroleum at the market price here the subsidies will probably be available in conclusion um, what i can say about the energy relations the best in the period was uh, from the year 2000 until 2008 at that period the subsidies constituted about 15 percent of gdp since then gradually the subsidies were diminishing and in 2020 if we look at the petroleum and all natural gas we no longer have the subsidies that we used to have to hold on to general energy subsidies those and uh, authorities tried to sell the trans gas and uh, join the Eurasian economic community those and authorities hope to then to buy the uh, energy products for the internal prices the second dependence the uh, area is the export of goods in the last 20 years uh, from 53 35 to 53 percent of exported person goods uh, went to russia it was an average 40 percent last year it was 42 percent and this year the last six months it was 60 46 percent it means that uh, the share of russian goods increased if we deduct the oil and oil prices from that the share of russia in the will be of over 50 percent here for a separate several sectors including industrial sector of production of oil and meat products the share of russia sometimes reaches 80 or 95 percent in the 
structure of the export. The third area of dependency on Russia is the foreign debt in various periods of time, particularly when the oil and gas prices were growing. Belarus, usually by the end of the year, managed to achieve or receive a uh, concessional loan. Usually those were from Russia, but uh, gradually they were grown. While before, in the past, Belarus were in the year 2004, 2005, could uh, borrow 150, 175 million US dollars per year. Later, these figures were much higher, one to two billion US dollars, in, which included the uh, Russia loans and uh, like 0 0.5 billion dollars that the Belnishkan Bank borrowed to build Belarus a nuclear power plant. So far, Belarus have accumulated 11 billion US dollars of foreign debt that Belarus is to pay in the future and also to Russia. While in the past, those debts were unconditional debts, um, Russia gave out the money without demanding in prioritization of the state. Uh, enterprises without uh, deepening integration. Now, uh, starting from the year 2017, those have not received any new loans. And in September, after the meeting with, of two presidents in Sochi, Russia promised to allocate $1.5 billion, the first tranche of $0.5 billion has already reached Belarus and the last and uh, the remaining two tranches have not been sent. I believe the money will not reach Belarus. And the fourth fear of dependency is the ownership in the economy, about 55% of the foreign direct investment that were accumulated during the dependence time belong to the Russian investors. If we add to this the Russian capital registered in such countries, uh, Switzerland and United Kingdom, the share of the Russian investment to the Russian Belarusian economy is about two thirds, which is a lot. I was, we must understand that the overall, the amount of the accumulated investment, the Belarusian investment is quite uh, small, uh, a bit more than $11 billion for Russian investment and Russian capital controls that is the number of the big enterprises russian those enterprises that are controlled by the russia is not so um, big petrans gas mother oil refining uh, facility mts and five banks who have a total share of 25 percent than the total bank share of Belarus. These are the four major spheres of dependency of Belarus and Russia. In some areas, the importance of Russia is bigger, for example, in the in export and the foreign debt. And in some of them, the dependency is not as critical as uh, that in the ownership area. Here, I would like to and my remarks. If there are questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Alice. Now, let's listen to Mr. Lev Lvovsky. Lev, please, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I would like to thank Evgeny for organizing this discussion. I hear together with Alice. No, it's actually it was a joint work with Alice, yes, of course. I would like to tell you more about the economy of Belarus. Alice has just told us about the huge subsidies and investments that are coming from Russia to Belarus. I would like to tell you a little bit about what and where they're used uh, or where the Belarusian economy is moving. 
Belarusian uh, President Lukashenko managed to create an image of the country, which is still an industrial country, where a lot, almost all, is controlled by the state. And of course, this means that um, Russia also sees it the same way. So when Russia gives uh, money to Belarus, some subsidies, uh, it is believed that this money goes to the whole of the economy for some productive payments to support the plants and factories. In reality, over the last several years, the share of uh, state enterprises is going down. The majority of those financial resources coming from Russia, they're going to the fewer number of businesses and individuals, the share of the people working in the state enterprises has decreased by 8% over the last eight years and now is about 29%. If we talk about the export of goods here in 2012, only 30% of export was produced by private companies. In 2019, the share of the private companies in the export constituted 56.5%. The role of the private business in Belarus is getting more and more uh, significant, while the major part of the investment is still getting to the hands of the state enterprises. Here, it is a good and bad news at the same time. The good news is that if we consider the Belarus and Russia relations, the good side is that the private businesses in many ways connected with Russia. And, and it also plays its part in the economic relations between the two countries. The share of the export of the private businesses to Russia so about 40 percent and this is absolutely natural we have a, the same language and the uh, same marketing space and of course they simplified access of goods to russia and since uh, we're in the same economic and trade union it's much easier to trade goods this uh, should mean that the close relations between Russia and Belarus must not be only linked to the state sector or relations between the concrete two leaders of the countries. Our economies are closely connected in many other fundamental reasons from, and we see uh, if the economy changes, uh, the more and more GDP flow, flows towards the private production, this relationship is not significantly, significantly altered. That's uh, all from me for now. Thank you. Using the right of the moderator, I would like to answer a small question to Alice and Lev. You showed us. This both of our economies, at least in Belarusian economy, the role of Russia is quite significant. It's clear that the Russian economy is bigger and the role of the Belarusian enterprise uh, goods and services is not as huge in Russia as it is in Belarus. Is now this relationship effective or what do you think? Is this relationship of a patron and uh, uh, employee, like a boss and employee, do you think it needs a new balance, which will be beneficial to both Belarus and Russia? Or is everything fine? Please be, sh be short, be brief. Alice, thank you for your, the question. As I already mentioned, the support that uh, for many years Russia provided to Belarus economy and 
which had its political foundation, he was used to support the relatively ineffective part of the Belarusian economy, which is still belongs to the state sector. And thanks to this Belarusian economy, or due to this Belarusian economy, was not as reformed as it could have been. Thanks to the discounted prices for oil and gas, Belarusian economy for many years could support the enterprises that did not produce much profit. And now this dose and the shape of the subsidies and uh, cheap loans is going down. We see that over the last six or eight years, the Russian economy has been stagnating. It uh, has no way of showing growth in this situation when the state sector is about 50%, makes up about 50% of the GDP. Overall, I agree with Alice. I would uh, divide this effectiveness issue uh, for the periods before 2010 and after that. Before 2010, this investment could be called ineffective because in Belarus, we could be observed the accumulation of the capital. The country was lacking capital and uh, Pay and the profits of the state factories was quite high. Belarus was growing with uh, uh, quite fast. St starting from 2010, those instruments and sources became no longer effective. The capital was already accumulated, and the non-changed management structure and non-changed approaches of the people who use this money and the capital led to the negative consequences. There was an attempt to, by using the social logic, to increase the labor productivity in the sense that some plants and factories were modernized using the loans from Russia. But the added, uh, the price of this capital was not considered. Thus, many factories that could have been profitable are now uh, uh, have a lot of foreign loans to pay off and are no longer competitive. It means that these cheap monies that at first helped the state and uh, the enterprise to develop and then uh, they uh, made a disservice to them. I would like to add you ask about the effectiveness of whether this cooperation between these two economies is effective. How can we measure effectiveness if Russia paid uh, or contributed $100 billion and the uh, Belarusian economists started developing as those of Estonia and Israel or the flagship economies? But every year, at the end of the year, the Belarusian government starts falling out with the Russian government because of the natural gas prices. Belarusians say that our prices are cheap, but not cheap enough to sustain the economic growth. Colleagues, thank you. Before we move to the Q&A, with participation of our expert uh, experts, I would like to ask Mr. Grigory Astapenia, who is a uh, research director of the Center for New Ideas in Minsk. He will give us more ideas. Thank you very much. Uh, even though I, in the last several months, I was uh, researching the many fields, uh, we, we don't really ask people much about the economy because the economy hasn't been growing much in the last 10 years uh, due to the economy and the political crisis in the country, people are leaving the country, and uh, so the businesses and foreign actors would not support the economic situation in Belarus. What kind of economic prospects should people feel? Uh, we talk about figures in September, we were told by the people that over 80% of the respondents said that the economic situation has recently became, become only worse. If we talk about relations or attitude to Russia, this is a more dynamic 
thing. It's uh, clearly more flexible and changing. This process should be assessed more regularly. Overall, Belarusians believe that the Russians to be the most culturally close uh, nation to Belarusians. But we can observe some political uh, difficulties between uh, uh, arguments between the two countries and the government. I will describe you the attitudes of three major social groups in Belarus towards Russia. First, those are people who support the protest, uh, second group are against the process, and third are just observers. Each of the group is about, makes about one third of the Belarusian population. In the first group, we observe among the biggest, among other number of Minskers and people with higher education, people with management positions, highly qualified staff. This group economically is the most active one. And this is the group which is uh, very much unhappy with the actions of Russia today towards the political situation in Belarus. And we observe the feeling of disappointment, disappointment in that group. Second group, the people who observe the situation, they support the people who uh, are not ready to take personal risks in favor of the protest. So they are against the violence uh, shown by the state authorities. They do not build trust and they trust less and less uh, the authorities of Belarus. Among them, there are lots of women, people in the service, employed in the service sector. These are people who are not as economically active as the proponents of the protest. In this group, we also observe some disappointment with Russia. If when we ask people if their opinion of, of Russia changed when Russia supported Lukashenko. About 78% percent of the first group said yes. Well, only 32% of the second group said yes. If we ask them about attitude of the Russian media and how they interpret the events in Belarus, 79% um, of pro supporters of protest and only 50% of observers said that they believe that Russian media uh, not acting properly. And the third group is the people who are against the protest, who do, want, do not want the protest to uh, win. In many ways, this is group uh, is consolidated around Alexander Lukashenko, but uh, we shouldn't believe that all the people inside this group want them to stay the president. And this group, among them, there are the the number of pensioners, people with the primary education and the vocational education is predominant. There are also people working for the state sector. In many ways, they are happy with how Russia uh, treats the, the situation now and that uh, it supports Lukashenko, even though not fully. Thank you, Rehor. I think the sociology is important for economy, for economics, because as you shown, the most economically active part of the population Belarus is starting to get more and more disappointed with Russia and the, its policy. Of course, it will affect the future of our relations. If it, it is, it continues. In this sense, sociology is important. Colleagues now I'll give floor to our Russian colleagues uh, who join us. I would like to thank them for this. And they agreed to express their opinion and to react to our, what our Russian friends, Belarusian said, friends said. The order is not important here. Now I'd like to ask Mr. Nikolai Petrov, who's a senior 
a researcher in the Chatham House. His interest, the political interest and research interest are about Russia. Please be brief so that we have possibility to listen to everyone who joined us. I'm sure many people would like to say a few words. I'll be brief. It was very interesting to listen to our colleagues. I would just like to add the uh, um, detail, which I believe is very important when we talk about the cooperation between Belarus and Russia in economy, in the economy. Uh, here I mean like family or household economy, and the relations at the level of this regular people, their, their assessment, according to some of them, about 1 million Belarusian citizens work in Russia, which is not that obvious compared to some Asian guest workers, but uh, in this sense, the difference between Russians and Belarusians is not that obvious. And I believe that a major aspect of the problem here is that uh, the connections at the level of the, each and every family that have the imprint on the how the Russian uh, society reacts passively to what is happening in Belarus now and to some uh, repercussions that we may observe in the future. One million of Belarusians is quite a lot for Belarus. Um, I'm not sure about the profits it gives to Belarusians, but the fact that we live in the uh, Union state and the Union state, unlike the Eurasian Union, was not mentioned here yet, hasn't been mentioned here yet. However, there are some general rules for common rules for Belarusians and Russians. And the first thing that people who come to Russia, and they see a special corridor at the customs for Russians and Belarusians. I think it's important when we talk about the really relationship in the economy. I mean, this human dimension. Thank you, Nikolai. I would also like to add that the topic of the union state did, uh, requires a separate meeting because Belarusian colleagues say that our Belarusian economic cooperation is not particularly effective. And this, I believe, is the foundation of the state. There are also integration processes of the high level, but we must understand the economic foundation. And if something needs to be amended there, and there must be some reforms, I'm sure they will be in Belarus, and hopefully they will be at some point in the future in Russia. This will change the concept of the Union State, and I believe this is uh, one of the important topics for us to discuss in the future. Hopefully, my Belarusian colleagues will agree to that. Now, I would like to like to give floor to Mithy Patapenko who is a famous economist, a financial economist and entrepreneur. Is a, I think he's a very interesting view on what is happening around. I have a short remark. When we were just starting to discuss the first and uh, see the first protests, Ramjan Yermanenko is my co-host a person who uh, suffered from the repressions. You mean co-host of your uh, program? Yes, indeed. I have a channel on YouTube, and I have my own small holding, and I have a small program at the Eco, Eco Moscow. Also, one of the former presidential candidates uh, was one of our guests. I know a lot about the Russian economy. I uh, 
I'd like to discuss what uh, channels were used to bring in the famous Belarusian shrimps to Russia. So I believe Hoya is the next president of Belarus. Unfortunately, I have to go to Kremlin to negotiate. I must say that I believe that this interconnection between Belarus uh, is uh, fatal, it's not effective. Lukashenko um, used manipulation in his relationship with Putin to build these relations. But just like any head of the Kolkhoz, the Sovkhoz, he created the working places. And there are quite a lot of those in Belarus, but they are all paid for, sponsored. Whoever is the head of Belarus next, they'll have to go to Kremlin to negotiate. Here's we face another limitation. But whatever happens in the next two or three years in Russia, maybe new people will come to power. I believe there will be Siloviki, the colonels, but uh, not wearing the gray suits, but uh, wearing uh, uniforms. What will Belarus sell to Russia I mean, politically? Because they, in terms of integration, it is um, not really sensible to uh, get another dotation or sponsored region from Belarus, Russia uh, and uh, hoping that Belarus becomes another part of Russia is uh, also uh, futile because they believe there will be strong resistance inside the Belarus and also if we uh, dream and fantasize and think that Belarus becomes another region of Russia who will be sponsored by Russia and the thought is what comes next. Apart from us getting a more direct access to foreign markets in terms of uh, logistics, but it doesn't solve the major fundamental issues that Russia has. Therefore, I believe we don't have any significant progress in the communication between the so-called authoritarian rulers. They don't need each other. Putin needs to solve their own issues about what uh, Russia is uh, in the future and Lukashenko needs to solve his problems locally. Uh, basically, how to um, get more money from Russia and uh, give it to the people who, who live in Belarus. I think he wants to either push out those protesters or suppress them, oppress them in the country. And uh, this will help him survive. It's not a simple situation. Both countries will have to get out of it for de decades because also there's a traditionally an enemy in the West. So it's a bank for deadlock for both of us. Even though uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, we still live in the same place, and like almost in the same roof. It's just we're surrounded by European and Asian countries. That'd be all for me. Dmitry, so what is your main thought? We hope that political crisis will be solved in Belarus and new democratic authorities, effective authorities will uh, appear. There will be some reforms that will follow. How will this have, uh, affect us? You said that there is a country like it's, it's trying to do something and Russia, which uh, will not let it, this happen. T 
I, I believe it's quite clear. So you believe there will be some uh, pressure on Belarus not to allow the, the reforms happen. Well, to be honest, we are uh, hybrid beings. We know how to manage regimes. We know how to... Um, when this all started, I said that if Tikhanovska, let's say tomorrow, for some reason, after, without the protest, without the crest in the prison and so on and so forth, even if she becomes the next president, Lukashenko says, I'm going to Rostov and uh, she'll have to negotiate with Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. And uh, I'll, I'll be blunt here. It's very difficult to deal with him. And it's much easier for him to deal with a new leader than with the old leader. Because the old leader has already has a lot of connections and the people who come after Lukashenko will find it more difficult than uh, it is for Lukashenko. Because I believe our leader um, knows very well how to smile and uh, control the regimes. Thank you, Dmitry. Now, I would like to ask uh, Boris Kravchenko to express his opinion. He's uh, head of the Labour Confederation in Russia. Is it a real trade union? available in Russia. Thank you very much for in, inviting me. I'm among the professional analysts and economists. I'm the, a trade union official, not more than this. However, I will just express my attitude to what, what is being discussed here. I would like to draw your attention to one more important feature of the Belarusian economy that makes it, puts it closer to uh, the Russian economy. It is the unlawful or situation with uh, em employees. Think about, the, there are 4.5 million people of uh, labor workers even though half of them work in Russia and Poland, still 4.5 million of active citizens actually employed in the economy is quite a lot. And the interests are not protected and they cannot affect uh, in any way the salaries or the working conditions. Nothing depends on them in the issue of uh, protection of their working place. And the system, mirrors uh, that in Russia, but in Belarus it has uh, like a particular shape. Belarus is the only country in the European continent where Alexander Gorich Lukashenko tried to introduce the elements of the forced labor. I mean the so-called uh, decree number nine on some steps to develop the wooden industry where workers had to pay to the employer and the state if they wanted to change their workplace. This is unprecedented. Uh, it clearly defines the work sphere, working sphere of Belarus. Uh, the salaries are critically low. The collective agreements uh, have no sense. Um, the labor code cannot be amended. The workers understand it very well. There's a clear resistance with the help of the our international community and trade unions. There are some independent organizations, including the Soligorsk. And there's some hope that, please note that what happened in August, the employees of the big 
state enterprises, industrial enterprises, they expressed their, they joined the protest and that was visible. It became clear that the work and movement is not only representatives are not only actors, but also have their own agenda. They created uh, track committees uh, and they had their own demands. First and foremost was the eradication of the forced labor elements and also conditions on the freedom of uh, unification, uh, like a trade union organizations and so on, with the right to change the labor code, not to have more rights in order to conduct collective negotiations. Maybe some of the participants of the discussion believe that some advantage here is observed in Belarus, uh, which should be saved after the collapse of the regime of Lukashenko, which I believe will happen soon. But we need to think whether it's, it is a real advantage, uh, whether we should uh, allow for the employees to say, to demand what they want in terms of their position, the social policy and the future of the Belarus in general. I believe the right to strike is uh, one of the most important rights for Belarus and workers in the future in the free Belarus that will contribute to the balance in the social relationship. Thank you very much. And then the important thought here was that uh, which is uh, probably useful to our Belarus and colleagues that it's important to start reforms. It's not only purely economical reforms that have to do with privatization. There's also reforms that have to do with the uh, labor relations. In Russia, we had this process happen in the uh, 1990s and uh, Start, which started in the 1980s, and we had various experiences, both positive and negative. Without this, without this module being considered, we cannot talk about the success of economic reforms. Based on what you said, and I believe the Belarusian colleagues will confirm this, the laborers are, have almost no rights. I mean, the state sector, because there is also a private sector that. Uh, other colleagues mentioned the situation there is different, but the state sector that uh, makes up a significant part of the Belarusian economy must develop further. And uh, this is one of the key points. I would like to add to what Boris said. Um, here, the main point in aspect of violation of the rights of workers workers' rights, it is the, that the, the welfare is almost, um, the unemployment benefits are almost non-existent in Belarus, the people, which means that, uh, well, it does exist, it's about $16 in the equivalent, but uh, therefore people are unlikely to change their employment. What we have now is people that are attached to the workplaces. This is what we're observing now in Belarus. And now we'll give floor to Mr. Professor Zastrovtsev. Hello, I'll be brief because my internet connection is not the best. Just a second, please. Unfortunately, our internet is connection is not as 
as good as that in Belarus. Thus, I have to constantly get reconnected. I work in the European University in St. Petersburg, which still exists, in the Modernization Center. We research all post-Soviet countries. Thus, for over 15 years, 15 years ago, we published a book called Soviet Union After the Collapse, where I had a chapter on Belarus. And now, obviously, I've been actively writing materials on Taiwan, a modernization there. Now, told that we have to go back to Belarus, and uh, I did just that. First and foremost, I am a pessimist. I publish in the Fantanka.ru during the protest time. I said that the, the protests are disappearing. Um, the Democrats that I knew said that uh, a bit more was left before the free democratic Belarus would appear. But I said, wait, hold on. If we talk about economy, Belarus must decide where it is headed. I don't think, I don't see a clear understanding of that. If you're staying with Russia, you're staying with Lukashenko, it's the same thing. If um, moving away from Russia, you're facing an economic collapse. In 2017, there was a big research conducted on subsidies, which has been mentioned a few times here, according to the IMF, about from 11 to 27 percent of Belarusian GDP came from the Russian support. In all overt and uh, hidden spheres. In Russian, Russian media often writes that this and that loan was given to Belarus. Uh, recently, it was $1.5 billion. Not a single time I read that the Belarus returned the loan. Thus, before you start reforms, you need to understand in Belarus, who are you going to be with? Are you going moving towards the EU, have an association agreement with the EU, or you stay with Moscow, which means with Lukashenko, Putin, Kremlin, and so on. The best advice was given by Kaha Bindukidze, I think everyone knows who it is, who he is, when he was the economic minister of Georgia. At, at the time, Russia blocked the export and import with Georgia. About 80% of wine, of Georgian wine, was exported to Russia. Bendukidze um, had a meeting with farmers. They asked him, what do we do next? And he gave them the in, in, advice forever. Just imagine that there's a ocean instead of Russia. So if you Belarusians imagine that there's an ocean instead of Russia, then you have chance for reforms. If you start looking for compromise with Russia, you will stay uh, what you are. I was very much surprised that uh, Belarusians got dis disappointed by the support of Putin uh, allocated to Lukashenko, 1.5 billion US dollars, and congratulations on uh, Lukashenko becoming the president. So the Russia, meaning that Russia did everything to keep Lukashenko in power. Well, basically, it happened the same in 1996. If Russia did not support Belarus, then uh, Lukashenko would no longer be president already back in 1996. So you need to decide who you're moving towards, the EU or Russia. 
Of course, uh, it will be followed by a number of reforms, uh, which are nothing new to many countries. I might have had an original remarks, but uh, still. Thank you, Andrei Pavlich. We understand your opinion. Okay, colleagues, we have uh, several questions that were received during the registration. Anton, do you think uh, you should read them out for our presenters to answer them? Or? Usually we favor the questions that uh, we get during the discussion. We have some of those as well. So we can choose. So please, can you read them out? I, we have four questions from Andrei Lavruhin. It will be just fair if we take only one of them since we're limited on time. The question to both presenters. They received this question about half past four. I think uh, he meant Lev and Alice. What is the share of the Russian capital at the state level and the state of the businesses, private business? I'll be brief. I already mentioned that in my presentation that, in fact, the share of the Russian capital and the Russian economy is not that big. That is, we have about uh, several big enterprises that were bought out, um, both enterprises and banks, that were bought out by the Russian capital and now have. I mean, they bought out partially or fully, like Beltran's gas. I was bought out uh, within four years of monopolist and five banks, Belgas from Bank, BPS Bank, Alpha Bank, Bank VTB. Five banks out of 24 commercial banks. The total share in the bank sector is about 20 to 25%. I mean, the assets. 49% uh, neither the controlling store. It is in the MTS um, telecommunication company and one of the petroleum processing companies. Uh, Moser, another one. So the four spheres where Russian capital own significant part of the Belarusian property. There is also the Russian capital in other fields and other areas, but it's not as significant. And those enterprises are not that big. So I mean here that uh, the controlling stake of one or two enterprises can affect the and have a multiplying effect on the whole of the economy. Would you think less. I think you're frozen there. I mean that uh, there are two key enterprises that Russian capital has a significant importance, uh, which is important for the whole of the economy. We don't have there mustn't be controlling stakes of all the enterprises. So. I can also add to this a thought that uh, that has to do with, with what Belarus can propose to Russia. And recently, we have been observing that some issues with the private property and the. Uh, uh, companies and enterprises that belong to the Russian capital, which is close and far away removed from Putin. It is a relative issue at the beginning of the political campaign. We saw that uh, what happened with Gazprom Bank and how easy it was to for uh, of Russian owners to lose their property placed in Belarus. 
Anton, please. We have more questions here in the chat, but please read out the ones that you have. Okay, those who came earlier have the priority. Fine. Pavel Mikhailovich Kudyukin from the Narodna Gramada Party is asking, what is the role of the independent trade unions in the transformation and uh, how the opinions of the wider population be considered during the political and economic hardships. Who is this question addressed to? I can answer this question. In Belarus, uh, uh, still see some independent trade unions, about 95% of employed workers. They are members of the state trade unions headed by Mr. Mikhail Orda, head of the, the political headquarters of Alexander Lukashenko. There's a independent trade union congress and the confederation, which is our partners, which is acknowledged by the international trade unions confederation. The biggest trade union uh, that is a member of this is uh, in Soligorsk. What is this role? Is not significant, like uh, the role of all independent organizations and parties in Belarus. But this role is important. My colleagues have been long been fighting for not only the implementation of the standards that are part of the international agreements that Belarus signed, that were ratified by Belarus, and they support independent initiatives all over the country. Now they experience significant growth since the workers of the big private and state organizations are looking for the ways to apply their activity, political activity. We now have a joint seminar with those and medics who would like to launch independent trade union. We're helping them because we have gone through this and we have we had thousands of applications, similar applications. Maybe there's no significant influence on the situation with the protest, but there's a possibility to legalize and support any independent initiatives of the payroll workers. In the future, we believe that this movement will only gain pace and uh, become more significant. While we were discussing this, Russian Belarusian trade union relations have gone much further than we thought, at least compared to our two of our economists. This is a very important point. Okay, Anton, what else do you have? Andrei Surzeltsev asked this question. Considering the uh, presenters uh, to do work closely with the Svetlana Tikhanovskaya's headquarters, it would be great to understand what are the economic plans of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. In particular, uh, is they planning to leave the union with Russia. Well, I'm, I must say that I'm a totally independent economic expert. It's probably a question to Alice now. The joint vision of the institutional reforms can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. As I said, this vision was described without the, in the letter, which was signed by more than 60 economists, mostly from Belarus and some Belarusian economists working abroad. 
at the end of the October. The end of October. This is uh, publicly available. I will write in the chat the link to this document. If those uh, reforms are a must, absolutely necessary, and we'll agree that they're important. Many of our colleagues agree to those, like the equal conditions for business process, independent of the ownership structure, independent of the size and industry. So the rule of law is another important point so that the laws will be, will be observed in Belarus and uh, everyone would be equal before the law, including the state authorities. Uh, decreased role of the state as the major power, major regulator, what is happening in the Belarusian economy, because the Belarus now the state affects not only the state sector, which contributes to 50% of GDP, but also it has sent plans and uh, from top to bottom, like the uh, presidential administration sends orders to regional executive commissions and uh, further on. And these uh, orders reach the state enterprises and uh, independent enterprises and the uh, state ministers not only regulate uh, the various enterprises but also own some of them so the role of the state must go down must diminish what alec mentioned is also a must a social policy must be reformed this is a precondition for any changes in belarus if people lose their workplaces, they must uh, have proper welfare that will allow them to look for another employment, allow them to be retrained. It is important in Belarus. Financial market needs to be developed further. It is underdeveloped in Belarus. Indeed, private enterprise in Belarus lack cheap uh, resources. So this letter has 11 points of such kind. I'll give you the link now in the chat. I would like to add in the question, there was a part about Tikhanovskaya planning to leave the Union State. I cannot say for Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, but in the letter that Alice just mentioned, that I also signed. There's not a single word about the Belarus leaving the European Economic Community, Eurasian Economic Community, or the Union State. But I don't think this is uh, necessary. It would be quite strange, as we said at the beginning of this meeting, irrespective of the policies, the Belarusian and Russian economies are heavily interconnected. So starting a new movement with economic collapse, with uh, cutting relations would be, I think, wrong. Uh, would be wrong for any uh, people in power in Belarus in the future, be it uh, Svetlana Zikhanovska or anyone else who can come to power. A few words about Union State. In the last several years, Union State has been in crisis. Colleagues uh, mentioned that the regular wars uh, about natural gas and petroleum products, minerals and food products exported to Russia were also made part of this. Lukashenko has regularly said at the meetings on the Eurasian Union that he was dissatisfied with how with the situation. So here, the question is not about uh, cutting all the ties, 
and starting everything from scratch. I believe, and my Belarusian colleagues should be more confident and more, more knowledgeable about this. We should uh, maybe re look again at what is happening in the Union State, so that it would be mutually beneficial to Belarus and Russia, and not just Russia bearing this uh, load of subsidies and it's for this demanding some steps, including political steps on Belarus. We need to find a balance. I believe it can be found. Uh, it doesn't mean that the Union state will be dissolved. It just needs to get a new foundations. If I'm wrong, colleagues, please correct me. I'm already answering, yes. In fact, Svetlana Tikhanovska and her economists that uh, work with her do not rec recommend to cut ties uh, in the framework of the Eurasian Economic Community or Union State. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite. We believe that Belarus must have uh, good relations with the East and the West. So as of today, we have open borders with the East, but we have high tariff limitations on uh, services and uh, goods with on the West. So we'd like to have a balance there so that Belarus will finally, after 28 years of negotiations, join the World Trade Organizations where all other remaining members of the Eurasian Economic Union already found themselves. It would be nice if Belarus had a deeper cooperation with all the countries. We have that in with Russia already, and it's better to be able to diversify that relations. As to the foreign debt, Svetlana Tikhanovska spoke that, uh, or stated that the loan agreements and other agreements that uh, were signed with the current non illegitimate authorities of Belarus, which is not supported by the majority of the people and which conducts repressive policies against some people, that these agreements or may be reviewed in the future. We're not talking about uh, reviewing the agreements that were they were signed in the past, but the agreement signed uh, after the Lukashenko became uh, lost his presidential powers the 5th November 2020. Okay, colleagues, I uh, see there is the last question remaining. Uh, we'll ask, let's ask this question to our presenters and also give the opportunity to finalize our discussion. I believe. Uh, and I hope that we'll meet regularly in the future. And there are some points that we must discuss in the future. That's this question. The question is about industrial military complex. The question is as follows. What is the connection between Belarus and Russia here? Secondly, what is the corruption element? Is it as strong as it used to be in the relations between Russia and Ukraine? These are two questions. I mean, Russia and Ukraine in the petroleum issues and the natural gas issues. So these are two elements of the question, part of the question. Who would like to answer? Alice, Ulyev. Well, it's hard to be concrete uh, answering this question. As to the industrial military complex, there are some sig recent significant cooperation between the two countries remaining uh, from the Soviet times. In some areas, it's quite deep. There is uh, There are new goods. Again, just like in other economic activities, if you're asking how will it change when the new authorities 
come to power. I don't know how, if it should be different to any other cooperation or other economic issues. As to the corruption element, I'm not an expert in that, so I cannot say anything particular. Uh, Liam, what, what do you think about this? Since it's uh, only the first series of meetings, uh, we need to define our format and area of discussion. What do you think will happen next? I think that uh, major channels of a cooperation uh, between Russia and Belarus uh, uh, were formed at the personal level between Putin and Lukashenko. Because of that, for many years, we saw the accumulation of various misunderstanding of what happened in the less of that country and its contacts in, uh, will be useful to all the participants in both countries. Uh, as to what was what is said today, in particular, what Professor Zastrovtsev said, I'm not a political scientist. I'm not uh, so in, uh, I cannot say for uh, Ms. Tikhanovskaya, but as a person who lives in the country, I believe that uh, what we see in Belarus is not a political revolution. It's not a decision to go to the West or move to or stay with Russia. I believe uh, the changes we observe here is a political, are of political nature and political uh, question is about the liberals or communists. I think the, what the protesters demand most is the cessation of the or stop to the political torture. It has nothing to do with the political favor, favorites. So I think those uh, basic values should be shared by liberals, conservatives, and communists. So probably there'll be a window of opportunity here. Uh, we'll be managed, we'll be able to agree on uh, that without changing the deeper levels of the economy, we could change the, not political structure, but the attitude of the authorities to the people in, of Belarus. And probably uh, I will try to smooth out the pessimism of Dmitry Potapenko in the sense that uh, Belarus has nothing to offer to Russia. I believe that Belarus could offer to Russia the normal relationship, which means asking for uh, fewer loans and accumulate fewer debt and continue the brother relations and partnership relations, but uh, not asking for more money from Russia and, and from Russian taxpayers. And uh, say the normalizing of the uh, economic relations, even though Russia is one of the last countries to support Lukashenko, the Russian capital is not protected here. I don't know how much it uh, coincides with the interest of Russians and uh, Vladimir Putin in particular, I don't know, but maybe there's a window opportunity for mutually uh, beneficial sol solution to this crisis. Alice, please. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for moderating this discussion. I would like to thank all the presenters, people who asked questions. There were many more questions and I saw all them in the chat. They're all important and significant. If we had more time, I'll be happy to answer them. Hopefully I'll have this opportunity to do this in the future on a regular basis. I believe 
we lack such discussions and we have been lacking them for decades decades uh, at the expert level such discussions were rarity we usually had uh, uh, high level talks involving presidents and prime ministers and hopefully this dialogue will continue we'll be working together to find out the ways out of the current political situation and find um, some changes and recommendations for Belarus and Russia. I would also like to end the session saying that I found this interesting that, uh, and I agree with Alice. As I said, I've never been an expert in Belarus. Uh, I know Ukraine much more, much better uh, for a number of reasons, also because of my Ukrainian heritage. And Belarus, for me, has also been a terror incognita before the events that we observe in Belarus and the events that we live and uh, sympathize with. I personally believe that we must take interest in Russia uh, in what is happening in Belarus, because we have a, a joint future. I believe uh, that, let's say, just like uh, Professor Zarastrostov said, that Belarus must uh, decide who, who to side with the West or the East in the ideological mm, um, sense, I believe it's the right and the pro-European choice is important. I believe that Belarus made it a long time ago, at least the majority of the population don't doubt this. And, but Belarus cannot simply turn 180 degrees and say to Russia goodbye, we're now moving to what's the EU. Uh, at the same time, the Belarus must set ambitious goals because there are some facts and trends that show that we are very much interconnected. I don't think it will end with the economic collapse. This is not I'm talking about that, but the cut or oh, no, the cultural ties. The, I believe is a bad result. What Kravchenko and Petrov said, the fact that the million of Belarusians work in Russia, who people who are Belarusian citizens, they work in Russia. There are a lot of lots of aspects that connect us. Either we want it or not, we need to find a joint common ground. It's not so easy. We all understand that. Uh, but for the new democratic Belarus, current Russia is not a easiest companion. There's also Europe, of course, but uh, I believe Belarus has chance to become uh, to balance out uh, policies in the western and eastern direction and be a, a hub. A country which uses all the pluses of cooperation with Russia and the and Europe, and of course the f other countries with the, which are placed further away. Rationally thinking, this is also good for Russia. It's better to have a, a highly integrated country as a neighbor than the Ukrainian crisis. I was very much. Uh, affected by the Ukrainian crisis. We were very much connected and now we see what is happening everywhere in all the spheres, including the public space, what uh, what Grigory Stepenia said about Belarusians. See what's happened in Ukraine the last several years. I think this is wrong. I'm not saying who's to blame for this. And we all 
many of us understand why it happened, but uh, in this sense, Belarus uh, has a unique opportunity with the new authorities. If Lukashenko continues to be a dictator, usurper of Belarus, he will spoil the relations with Russia even further. And the Russian public opinion also sees the, observes the torture and repressions. People in Russia um, are very negative about this. And I believe we should understand the important role of such contacts because the information uh, is accumulated and it's heavily considered by the people who make decisions. It happens both in Belarus and Russia. Let's continue our meetings. I hope Alice will agree with me on this. We will smooth all the corners, smooth all the difficulties, so that we will continue being um, brotherly nations. Just like in the past, when we came to Minsk without noticing any borders and feeling ourselves part of the common European space where human rights are observed, where there's a rule of law and democracy prevails with, with effective market economy and uh, social programs. I'd like to thank everyone. I would like to apologize to us who join us as a listener, but probably didn't have time to ask questions or say anything. But that was the first time for us. Hopefully, we'll have similar missions in the future. Please follow our announcement. We'll do it once again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers. I'd like to thank the interpreter. Thanks. Thank you, Press Club.